for someone who is such a strong writer and has a, seems an optimism that even I can't shake and that wants to you know, bring the wrong writers on, why do you reach to collective creation? That's a great question. Um, there's just nothing like the stink of authenticity. And I, I have learned that from just listening. And that's where I get my best material, listen, like that, that Arabic account of torture. And the detail of the fan, I couldn't make up. It's too specific, too extraordinary. And my students, every semester, telling me there's 25 stories I hear. I just say something that changed you. It could be as small as stealing a chocolate bar, or your parents' divorce, or a death, or, 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 or a lie. And I think you cannot replicate this. You cannot make it up. And so the first one was Body and Soul, and that just happened because I was commissioned, and it was very well funded because it was Dove, and I had, obviously I had some ambivalence because it was a multinational corporation and everything, but I thought these women's voices have to get out there. And they were such a diverse group. Many of the stories were harrowing and raw, and their triumphs just being there. Uh, and it was such an experience. I saw the audience just go, oh, we want more. And instead of like, not another Ibsen or what, you know, I love Ibsen, but you know. So you're reaching for authenticity, authenticity. through collective voices. That is yeah. in the tradition of Paul Thompson and all that kind of collectivism. Well, I did start with my great excitement about all that, yes. And, I lo and as an actor, I, my, my favorite place was improvising because then right. I would, the writer and the actor come together, right? And so I was always very excited by that. And, and they're collectives and they're not. It's, it's sort of di so difficult to describe because I, I spend weeks panning for gold, just saying, what are your regrets? Any, what do you hope for? I d any question, tell me a spicy story, but not too spicy, so 12-year-olds could hear. Um, and just listening, get a transcriber, a student transcribes, and then I go through and I create the play, and a lot of it's movement. So the director, With creator, them. and me. Oh yeah, like I'll say, okay, you just start spinning your wheelchair. Now you zoom to the back, and I'll try. And now you yell out what you hope for, and uh, and always have music on stage. Always like one of these people in wheelchairs is an incredible pianist, incredible, and um, and I start bringing that in early, and then somebody say, hey, I can do this trick. Oh great, let's see it. Oh I know, if she does that trick, why don't you crawl up here, and then you'll say this. So I'm creating the play using only their words. I will not put, my, unless there's a little stitching I have to do. And I mean, with Rare, there was a bit of stitching. And sometimes people just blanked. And I say, well, what about this? Do you think this? They had to endorse it. Um, it sounds like over your career that you have started off, and forgive me, on the patriarchal side, saying, these are my words, these are my characters, this is my play, please do it like this, to the other end of the spectrum saying, I have no wish to own any of this. I only want it to be authentic. And if those voices come from you and you and you, fine, that's the play. In a sense, but I'm still definitely the vision behind it. Like I, <coughs> the, in a way, somebody said, how, do, how is this different from writing? It's not really, because I channel my characters, and they're real, and they're not me. And same with these people are real. And I am choosing his story about the window not his story about the bed. Um, and I, I listen to them until I find the right ones. It's a, and yet, yes, you're right in that I'm respecting everything they say, and I'm, help, I'm midwifing them into the world. But I am creating a play with the raw material of them. And is there not something overtly or indirectly political about that? Yes. And that you are saying, yeah. It is a democracy of yes. voices and stories. I am. It's not a top down yeah. producer driven, television driven. You're every the no. world will act this way in stories. It's bottom up. And that is democratic. That is, is collective. That is Yeah, I mean Crystal I in, in Rare, Crystal says comes I said, What do you all hope for? And she comes out and says, I want to raise a child one day. And you know everybody's thinking that what I love about it, it puts us in a gray area, We're complicated. Yes, it would be wonderful, but would that be right? Would that be okay? Would that, what am I, am I judging? Dylan comes out, he's 23, and says, I want to have sex one day, and everybody laughs. But why are they laughing? If a strapping 23-year-old soul pepper actor said that, could, well, yeah, you haven't yet, you know? Um, and that's, those to me are just glorious theater moments. People's discomfort with Crystal saying, I want to raise a child one day. That's what she really wants. Here's one thing, though. She did say, 
I want to have a romance with someone who doesn't have Down syndrome. I, I couldn't put that in. I couldn't let Why her not? say that. Why not? Because it would hurt the feelings of the rest of the ensemble. And it's a self-hatred that I could write about, but I, it would feel like an endorsement. It would feel like, because we were all about celebrating it to have Down syndrome. It, it can be as a beautiful thing, as a wonderful thing. They are unique and rare, and why would we want to extinguish that community through termination? I have one of them dance the dying swan, and it's an in incredible. Nick is chubby. You know, glasses, when he dances, he's a god. And Veronica Tennant sat next to him and was just like, that's the best I've ever seen that. Yeah, because it's about, and I chose The Dying Swan because it's about a dying community if we're obsessed with perfection. So if she says, I don't want a Down syndrome, I can't put it in the frame of, yes, but she's only speaking, she's internalizing discrimination. Right. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So that's what I mean by I, I pick and choose. And she said it a lot of times, you know. And I'd go, oh, Crystal, don't say that. She'd go, I'm different from the rest of them. You know, I mean, so that kind of thing, you can't, yeah. The other thing that seems to me going on in your writing is you seek to unite people and not divide them. Yeah, absolutely. And that is another sort of, I don't want to say it's a political point of view, yeah. but it is a point of view about the Canada that I, that I enjoy, yes. that I champion, that yeah. we are a, a, a nation of creators or voices or political that actually unites people. That's it. It's not a methodology, it's not a belief, it's not opinion, it's not a text that we have to do. But indirectly we seem to want to do that, whether it's mm -hmm. on the subway or what's in the weather. You write a collective or we seem to want to do this. And yes. The political apparatus that we have now at the federal government is the opposite exactly. of our instincts, exactly. which is to unite and that's mutually true. understand. And that's why Paul Thompson, the, the, the farm show and the collective, says something very Canadian about that. Yeah. yeah. And, yet, and yet you had to have, Paul was a strong, a very strong visionary and voice <laughs> and bossy boots and all that, but you, got it, you had to have that. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise it's a mess. Everybody goes on and on and sits on stools and, you know, 